Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambudasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambudasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambudasa Homage to him, the Holy One, the Worthy One, the Fully Enlightened One. Sadu, sadu, sadu. So I basically gave you a little bit of an introduction. And um, so we're talking about today, looking at the meditation and we're going to go in Narada's book and we're going to take a look at what he said about the different sublime states of Brahma Viharas. And we read you a little bit of that. And then we can talk about this a little bit. Where I was going uh, when I was talking to you uh, earlier a little bit was that there are three kinds of meditation that are actually in existence today instead of two. There's not just a one pointed and a choiceless awareness and that's it. There's also the option of opening up the peripheral view inside when you close your eyes and try to close your eyes in the darkness, you look at like a screen in front of you. You can pretend it's a movie screen to start out with if you want to. And as you watch, all you're doing is witnessing. Now this is probably, believe it or not, one of the hardest things people can do in meditation is just watch because when we come out of meditation, we're busy in life. We're thinking about chores. We're thinking about what we have to do next. And we're constantly analyzing and deciding and thinking all the time with a lot of mental proliferation. And all of a sudden we come along and we say, we want you to sit, but just watch. And that's going to go all the way to the level of simply letting go of me trying to be there or accomplish anything. So it's letting go and taking the exercises the Buddha gave, the monks in reference to anatta and working it, this is not me, this is not mine, this is not myself. You can play with this all day long when you're working, when you're taking care of people, when you're going uh, driving or anything, you know, this traffic jam, it's not me, it's not mine, it's not myself. I'm just here, it's in the present time, no reason to donk my horn at <laughs> 5,000 cars. You know, no reason just to be, is to relax in the present time, understanding a couple things, to make it helpful for you to relax, is first Anicca, whatever's here happening, it will change. So everything's changing and sometimes we can't see how it changes we have to examine it you know i remember i told a bunch of children once everything is constantly changing and they said oh yeah prove it so what we did we took some uh yarn some wool yarn and we put it in a square like this about one foot square on the grass in the backyard so we took a picture of it Next day, they went out and said, uh-uh, hadn't changed a bit. <laughs> I said, wait a couple days. Is in the summertime. We took it every other day. We took a picture. Then we put them up on a screen, and we looked at them carefully. And you know what? Everything did change every single day. They're the same group of kids that told me that they didn't want to play in the backyard because nobody was there, and there's no, no one to play with back there at all. And I said, yeah, really? So at that point, we got a shovel and we cut a, a block out and flipped it over on the picnic table and gave each one of them a box and said, why don't we take a look at who lives in the backyard? <laughs> and they found all kinds of things in there of who was living in the backyard. So the ant people are there and the grub people and the beetle people and the worm people, all these people are there, you see? And um, you're not alone. But everything is changing all the time. So why get hung up on I'm stuck? Because wait 10 minutes or wait one day. 
it's going to change. Everything always changes. So when we look at this practice of tranquil wisdom meditation, it's relaxed. It's open inside. The idea is to smile, to allow your mind to stay open, sharpen your awareness, and just watch and witness and see what happens. Okay, so we're going to read today about what Narada had to say about the Brahma Viharas in this book. He says, rare is the birth as a human being. Hard is the life of mortals. Do not let slip this opportunity. Dhammapada. Man is a mysterious being with inconceivable potentialities. Latent in him are both saintly characteristics and criminal tendencies. They may rise to the surface at unexpected moments in disconcerting strength. This is everybody. How they originated, we know not. We only know that they are dormant in man in varying degrees. Within the powerful mind in this complex machinery of man, there are also found a storehouse of virtue and a rubbish heap of evil. And with the development of the respective characteristics, man may become either a blessing or a curse to humanity. So those who wish to be great and noble and serviceable, who wish to sublimate themselves to serve humanity both by example and by precepts, who wish to avail themselves of this golden opportunity as human beings, endeavor their best to remove those latent vices and cultivate the dormant virtues. Now to dig up precious gems embedded in the earth, men spend enormous sums of money and make laborious efforts. And sometimes they even sacrifice their lives. But to dig up the valuable treasures latent in man, only persistent effort and enduring patience are necessary. Even the poorest man or woman can accomplish this task for wealth is not an essential prerequisite to the accumulation of transcendental treasures. It's about transcendence, transformation in our lives to pursue what the Buddha was teaching. Someone said to me, well, what do we transform in Buddhism? What do we transcend? These two words, you need to play a word game and put that down and write what you think happens to you when you're working with this training. It is strange that the vices latent in man seem to be almost natural and spontaneous. It is equally strange that every vice possesses its opposite sterling virtue, which does not, however, appear to be so normal and automatic, though still within the range of all of us. One powerful destructive vice in man is anger, dosa. The sweet virtue that subdues this evil force and sublimes man is loving kindness, metta. Cruelty, himsa, is another vice that is responsible for many horrors and atrocities prevalent in the world. Compassion, karuna, is the antidote. Jealousy, isa, is another vice that poisons one's system and leads to unhealthy rivalries and dangerous competitions. The most effective remedy for this poisonous drug is appreciative joy, mudita. There are two other universal characteristics that upset the mental equipose of man. They are attachment to the pleasurable and aversion to the non-pleasurable. 
these two opposite forces can be eliminated by developing equanimity, upekka. So these four sterling virtues are collectively termed in Pali, Brahma Viharas, which may be rendered <clears throat> by modes of sublime conduct, sublime states, or divine abodes. These virtues tend to elevate man or woman, and they make one divine in this life itself. They can transform a man into Superman. If all try to cultivate them, irrespective of creed, of color, race, or sex, the earth can be transformed into a paradise where all can live in perfect peace and harmony as ideal citizens in the world. Now, the four sublime virtues are also termed the illimitables, apamania. They are so called because they find no barrier or limit, and they should be extended towards all beings without exception. They embrace all living beings, including animals. Irrespective of religious beliefs, one can cultivate these sweet virtues and be a blessing to oneself and to all others. Metta comes first. The first sublime state is metta. Maitri is the Sanskrit. It means that which softens one's heart and the state of a true friend. Remember we said that one of the things that has to happen, the reason we start by teaching you dana first, the dana, the generosity opens the heart and the dana is the metta working ac externally. It is defined as the sincere wish for welfare and general genuine happiness of all living beings without exception. It is also explained as a friendly disposition for a genuine friend, sincerely wishes for the welfare of his or her friend. Just as a mother protects her only child, even at the risk of her life, even so one should cultivate boundless loving kindness towards all living beings, that is the advice of the Buddha. It is not the passionate love of the mother towards her child that is stressed here, but her sincere wish for the genuine welfare of her child. Metta is neither carnal love nor personal affection, for grief inevitably arises from both of those. Metta is not mere neighborliness, for it makes no distinction between neighbors and other people. Metta is not mere universal brotherhood, for it embraces all living beings, including animals, our lesser brethren and sisters that need greater compassion because they are helpless. Metta is not political brotherhood or racial brotherhood or national brotherhood or even religious brotherhood. Political brotherhood is confined only to those who share similar political views, such as the partial brotherhood of Democrats, socialists, communists, and so forth. Racial brotherhood and national brotherhood are restricted only to those of the same race and nation. Some nationalists love their race so much that sometimes they ruthlessly kill innocent men, women, and children because they unfortunately are not blessed with blonde hair or blue eyes. The white races have particular love for the white skin, the black for the black, the yellow for the yellow, the brown for the brown, the pale for the pale, and the red for the red. 
Others of a different complexion are at times viewed with suspicion and with fear. Very often to assert their racial superiority, they resort to brutal warfare, killing millions of mercilessly raining bombs from the sky above. The pathetic incidents of World War II are striking examples of which can never be forgotten by mankind. But amongst some narrow-minded peoples within the wider circle of their ancient nations, there existed minor circles of castes and class where the so-called brotherhood of the powerful oppressors is so limited that the oppressed are not even permitted to enjoy bare human rights merely because of the accidents of the birth of a class. These oppressors are to be pitied because they are confined to their watertight compartments. Meta is not religious brotherhood either, owing to the sad limitations of so-called religious brotherhood, human heads have been severed without the least compunction since outspoken men and women have been roasted and burnt alive and many atrocities have been perpetuated with baffling descriptions. Cruel wars have been waged that mar the pages of history. And even in this supposedly enlightened 21st century, the followers of one religion still hate or ruthlessly persecute or even kill those of other faiths merely because they cannot force them to think as they do because they have a sufficient label, insufficient label, a different label. But if on account of religious views, people of different faiths cannot meet on a common platform like brothers and sisters, then surely the missions of compassionate world teachers have pitifully failed in the past. Sweet, sweet Metta. It transcends all these kinds of narrow-minded brotherhood or sisterhood. It is limitless in scope and range. Barriers, it has none. Discrimination, it makes not. Metta enables one to regard the whole world as one's motherland and all people as fellow beings. Just as the sun sheds its rays on all without any distinction, even so sublime Metta bestows its sweet blessings equally on the pleasant and the unpleasant, on the rich and the poor, on the high and the low, on the vicious and virtuous, on the man, the woman, the animal, the human. Such was the boundless Metta of this Buddha who worked for the welfare and happiness of all those who loved him as well as those who hated him and even attempted to harm and kill him. The Buddha exercised metta equally towards his son Rahula. He taught him about it before he left to teach, if you remember, in Majjhima Nikaya number 62, section 18. He taught this metta equally to his son, his adversary Devadatta, his attendant Ananda, his admirers, and his opponents. The loving kindness should be extended in equal measure towards oneself as towards a friend, a foe, and neutral alike. <clears throat> Suppose a bandit were to approach a person traveling through the forest with an intimate friend and a neutral person and an enemy, and suppose he were to demand that one of them be offered as a victim. <clears throat> now, if the traveler were to say that he himself should be taken, then he would have met it towards himself. If he were to say that any one of the other three persons were to be taken, then he would have no metta towards them. Such is the characteristic of real metta. 
in exercising this boundless loving kindness, oneself should not be ignored. This subtle point should not be misunderstood. For self-sacrifice is another sweet virtue and egolessness is yet another higher virtue. The culmination of this metta is the identification of oneself with all beings. Sabatata. Making no difference between oneself and others. The so-called I is lost in the whole. Separatism evaporates. Oneness is realized. There is no proper English equivalent for this graceful Pali term of metta, goodwill, loving kindness, benevolence, and universal love are suggested as the best renderings you will find. The antithesis of metta is anger, ill will, hatred, and aversion. Metta cannot exist with anger or vengeful conduct. Now, the Buddha states to us that hatred does not cease through hate, but only through love alone will hatreds cease. Metta not only tends to conquer anger, but also does not tolerate hateful thoughts towards others. He who has metta never thinks of harming others nor does he disparage or condemn others. Such a person is neither afraid of others, nor does he instill fear into any person. A subtle indirect enemy assails metta. In the guise of a friend, it is selfish affection, pema. For unguarded metta may sometimes be assailed by lust. And this indirect enemy resembles a person who lurks afar in the jungles or in the hills and causes harm to the other person. Grief springs from affection, but not from metta. This delicate point should not be misunderstood. Parents surely cannot avoid having affection toward their children and children towards their parents, husbands toward their wives and wives toward their husbands. Such affection is quite natural. The world cannot exist without mutual affection. The point is to be clarified here is that unselfish metta is not synonymous with ordinary affection. A benevolent attitude is the chief characteristic of metta. And he who practices metta is constantly interested in promoting the welfare of others. He seeks the good and beautiful in all, but not the ugliness in others. So there are attendant blessings of metta. First, he who practices metta sleeps happily. As he goes to sleep with a light heart, free from hatred, he naturally falls asleep at once. And this fact is clearly demonstrated by those who are full of loving kindness. They are fast asleep immediately on closing their eyes. Number two, as he goes to sleep with a loving heart, he awakes with an equally loving heart. Benevolent and compassionate persons often rise from bed with smiling faces. Number three, even in sleep, loving persons are not perturbed by bad dreams. Because they are full of love during their waking hours, they're peaceful in their sleeping hours too. So either they fall into deep sleep where they have pleasant dreams. Number four, he becomes dear to human beings. As he loves others, so do others love him. When persons look at a mirror with a smiling face, 
a similar face will greet him or her. If on the contrary, she looks with a wry face, she will see a similar reflection. The outside world reacts on one in the same way that one acts towards the world. One full of faults himself is apt to see the evil in others, the good he ignores in them. An English poet, Bolton Hall, has put it in a beautiful way. I looked at my brother, he said, with the microscope of criticism, as I said, how coarse my brother is. I looked at him through the telescope of scorn, and I said, how small my brother is. And I looked at him in the mirror of truth, and I said, how like me my brother is. Why should we see the ugliness in others when there is evil in the best of us and good in the worst of us? It would be a source of pleasure to all if we could see the good and beautiful in all. Number five, he who practices metta is dear to non-humans as well. Animals are also attracted to him, radiating their loving kindness as ascetics live in wild forests amidst ferocious beasts without being harmed by them. And number six, owing to his power of metta, he becomes immune from poison and so forth, unless he is subject to some inexorable karma from the past. As metta is a constructive, healthy force, it has the power to counteract hostile influence. And just as hateful thoughts can produce toxic effects, in this system, even so loving thoughts can produce healthy physical effects. It is stated that a very generous and devout woman named Supia, who had a wound in her thigh, was healed on seeing the Buddha. The peaceful thought vibrations of the Buddha and the woman combined to produce a salutary effect. When the Buddha visited his birthplace for the first time, his son Rahula, who was only seven years of age, approached him and spontaneously remarked, oh, ascetic, even your shadow is pleasing to me. The child was so much dominated by the Buddha's merit and metta that he deeply felt its magnetic power. Number seven, Invisible deities protect him because of the power of his metta. Metta leads to quick mental concentration. Number eight, as the mind is not perturbed by hostile vibrations, one pointedness can be gained with ease. And collected concentration can happen very well. With mind at peace, he will live in a heaven of his own creation on earth. Even those who come in contact with him will also experience that bliss. Number nine, metta tends to beautify one's spatial expressions. The face as a rule reflects the state of the mind. When one gets angry, the heart pumps blood twice or three times faster than the normal rate. Heated blood rushes up to the face, which then turns red or even black. At times, the face becomes repulsive to sight. Loving thoughts, on the contrary, gladden the heart and clarify the blood. The face then presents a lovable appearance. It is stated that when the Buddha, after enlightenment, reflected on the causal relations in the Patana, his heart was so pacified and his blood so clarified that the rays of different hues, such as blue, yellow, red, white, orange, and a mixture 
of these emanated out of his body. Number 10, a person imbued with metta dies peacefully as he harbors no thoughts of hatred toward anyone. Even after death is serene face, it reflects a peaceful death. And 11, since a person with metta dies happily, he will subsequently be born in a blissful state and he has gained the jhanas or the levels of understanding and the ecstasies as well, and he will be born in the Brahma realm. So this is the part that goes this far. And I think I can do a little bit more here, which is about the power of the metta, what you can do with it. Okay, I think maybe we, we should stop here and we should talk a little bit about this. Okay, so what you're hearing him talk about in development in the metta is really important because you're learning to set up vibrations around you. These vibrations can be felt from people as much as 500 feet away from where you're standing. If you did a circle, it would be the diameter of the circle would be about 500 feet from the center out. This is quite amazing, you know, because there are stories in the texts where there were small cities, towns and small cities where in monasteries, the monks were practicing metta. Everybody practiced metta. And because of that, there was no type of domestic violence. There was no arguments. If there was any upset that occurred, forgiveness happened very quickly and people were sending loving kindness to each other. That's what was being taught at the temple. That's what everyone was doing. So there wasn't really a divorce rate. There were no unhappy companionship and relationship situations that were going on because meta the power of it was around there's another story a modern day story in washington dc there was a group of people who wanted to see the effect of meta on the city in comparison to the at the time washington dc was like the murder capital of the world one of them but in that hemisphere i think and what happened was they went down near the Capitol building near, uh, there's a good side and there's a bad side. And um, they were sort of in the middle where the police uh, location was. And they stayed, did a circle of Meta, and they did this for several days each uh, month. And the days that they were doing the Meta, when they got the chart back at the end of two months, they looked and the murder rate had gone down 35% in the area. What happened? The only thing that changed was there was about 100 people in a room together practicing Meta, sending it out to all beings in the area. So you think about what was happening. In another situation, we remember there was Gosananda, a monk, uh, who was in Cambodia, where the soldiers were going to come and kill the people in the village. And they took his robes and threw him in the house with these other people and told them they were all going to be killed. And what happened in his situation was when they came to get the first person, he jumped forward and said, take me, don't take them. They didn't like that at all. Because this group in that time, what they wanted was the people not to help each other, to be totally frightened and to only take care of themselves as much as they could. And so they punished him by hooking him on the ceiling in a chain link fence and telling people they couldn't give him water or food or anything. And they were giving them very little food. He was like that for over a week's time. They were sneaking water to him and little pieces of food just enough to survive. And soon the soldiers just left and they took him down and they said, what were you thinking? You must have been full of hate and resentment for what they did and what they were planning to do. You must have been just like that. And he smiled at them. He said, no, no, I was sending them loving kindness the whole entire time. Sending loving kindness, not just to you in this room. I was sending loving kindness to all of them. And it was touching those soldiers. There was such a genocide that happened at that time. You imagine how these people felt 
about what they were required to do being soldiers under that setup with the Khmer Rouge was really a terrible, terrible time. And they were asked to, for instance, kill everybody if they had glasses. One of the things the Americans found um, where they had a place in the mountains, they found heaps of skulls, big piles of skulls, but they also found big piles of what? Of glasses. And his, his theory of Pol Pot believed if he had wiped off the face of the earth, anyone that could read or was literate at all, they could reclaim the power of the empire of the Khmer Rouge again. This is what I was told by people. And that's a pitiful way to think, you know, just eliminate everyone who has any ability for a reason. And they, they got rid of the monks, got rid of the people who could read, who were educated, everyone they possibly could find. And then they had to start all over again over there. They had to start with Buddhism again. So their monks are behind in a lot of things, but they started and have a whole system now, yeah. So I just wanna know if you all are feeling the effects of this metta if you are practicing it on a regular basis. Because to practice metta, it's really growing and it, these things start to affect you. So what's going on for you? That's what I'm wondering, yeah, May. Can you hear me? Ah. You can't hear me? Can you, can you hear? Can I? Can you hear me? I can't hear you. Let okay. me see if I can. Was I'll, it the microphone? I, I don't know if Bunty's still here, but was no. it the microphone or what was I supposed to do to try this? Um, can you try to talk to me now? No? Does anybody? Does anybody know what I can try to change on the settings? I, I don't know why I can't hear May at all. Does anybody know? Rowie, do you know whether I can try something on the on the system? I can hear you. Try selecting a different speaker. Okay. I can um Okay. Can you talk now? Baba Black Sheep. Nope. Okay. Rowie, talk to me. No, I can't hear Rowie either. Why can't I hear? This is so awful. <laughs> I don't know why. I'm not sure why. Test speaker and microphone. That's interesting. Can you talk to me now, May? Hello? Ah, okay, I can hear you, that's great. Oh, okay, Good. okay, that, that'll save me some typing in the chat. <laughs> okay. Well, would you, would you kind of remember, I just need to test the speaker, get in there and test the speaker. I won't remember this, okay? So tell me what's going okay. on, May. Uh, actually, I have a question with regards to the meta vibration. So. So in terms of these vibrations, I mean, if we if we really practice this, will this um, somehow um, influence our intuition? Um, so yeah, in the in a very basic sense, for example, yeah. like um, knowing where to where to go for groceries to have like a better experience, or like avoiding unsafe environments, like kind of have the intuition. Yeah not to go somewhere or like at you, work for this example. Is, yeah, yeah, it's about it's about um, picking up. This is like an act here, see? <laughs> That's not too bad. I have to do my glasses. I haven't done them yet. And these old ones are just not really working. They put the, the thing for the computer down here at the bottom. <laughs> so I can like this way, I can see you. Okay. Um, some people come, up into adulthood and they can naturally sense things around them and they sense them when they're children too. Some people, their sensitivity is not tuned up, okay? You need to practice with using it, okay? Practice with, uh, you know,
being aware of everybody is walking around with vibrations. If we could draw people the way they're really happening, we draw pictures of batteries with legs and arms walking around and they're all have vibrations coming off of them. And, and some of this is dark and some of it is light and some of it's in the middle, you know? And you, you know, if you grew up and you were doing a lot of digital work and you were doing a lot of research work and you were doing a lot of uh, academic work, sometimes people don't have the ability to do sense, sensitivity in the beginning, but they can develop it. So a lot of these things are programs inside us that we just simply didn't use in relationship to our life. That's all. And we need to start being aware, like you, you take a walk in a park or someplace where there's some nature and stuff and become aware of not just the, the picture of surroundings, but then you kind of close your eyes and just feel the environment, you know? See, when I find somebody who hasn't got their intuition working, chances are they can't feel when it's gonna rain or when it's gonna snow. Chances are they can't sense not to go through the light until after it's turned green and they paused for a moment because somebody might run the light, you see? And a friend of mine had an accident like that. She said, I felt so stupid because I, I felt like I should pause and I didn't. I put my gas and somebody ran the light and hit her on the side, you see, really badly. So she said, I felt so silly. I should have I sensed there was something else going on. And I, I can't explain it, but when you work with Meta, you are opening up, uh, you, are, you are toning down uh, the, the level of clutter that's in your head. You know, if you could see, I, I don't have that picture here, but I'll try to remember to bring it. I was going through my files and pictures and I saved the stuff that I kept from research I found. And, and you know, when you see the brain of somebody who has a lot of red inside the brain um, and it's all pressing, that's the non-meditator. When you see the meditator, there's just not that much. And the less and less and less there is of it as it shrinks down, the more and more sensitivity you can have for vibrations around you. So the message here, the message here is to sit longer if you can, sit longer. And at least one day a week, try to sit without a clock, without concern for the clock. If you can figure out a way to let that happen one day a week, to try to sit without a clock. And then uh, when you take a walk, stay open. Send, try sending the meta to all beings in all directions as you're walking and then just keep smiling in it and looking up and you're, you're sending them in all directions and you start with at least start with three minutes in each direction, front, back, right, left, down into the earth, up and through all around, all around and walk inside this globe where you're doing it all around and, and imagine the globe is here and you feel this meta vibration and bathe in this meta vibration. And then when you let go of that, you go to work and you, you start in the morning. In the morning, you know, if you're in a position, office managers can be really, really lousy positions sometimes. Um, the one that I was helping my friend with for a while, there was 11 corporations in that building. And we were handling five of those corporations through our desk and terminals area, you know, and there was another group over here for a couple of the other ones. So this was a huge place, you know, but you could feel these people descending upon you and, and you made you so tired and exhausted. But later on, when I was learning to practice with Bonte, I was doing some stuff for some people and I could feel what was going on in the room. And he said, well, put yourself in a meta bubble before you go to work. Say, create this meta bubble around you like this and just fall down around to your toes. And I'm going to be in this meta bubble today. And that's what I'm going to feel is what well, the vibration of myself coming out and putting that's going to be sending it out to you. You see, now what happens with meta is if somebody really gets into an hour and a half steady, maybe in the morning and at night, and then they're working, they go back into an office. 
one office manager in a construction company in New York when she went in after working a 10 day retreat and getting her meta going really strong, the production went up for everybody. Because why? Because she was smiling all the time. Everybody working under her in the office, there were 15 other women. This is a big place, you know, 15 other women, just the idea of 15 other women. <laughs> You know, but 15 other women working and they were struggling before. And all of a sudden, when they saw she was happy and had let go and was working only in the present time piece, and she was gearing her work set up in this present time, and then the next piece, present time, and the next piece, present time, they started doing it. And they were feeling first better a lot and getting brighter. And she's just getting brighter in that office, brought the production up and her husband said, wow, that's something. And it really what happened in like 30 days after she went home from retreat. So we affect the world around us. The idea we can't affect anybody around us is such a ridiculous idea <laughs> because we are vibrations. We are frequencies and the frequency of loving kindness it's not just vibration it's a frequency that can be measured they can out cook you uh, cook you right hook you up they can cook you too but they can hook you up and you have all this stuff on you're doing this and everybody's laughing in the office at that point i guess <laughs> you know and um Everyone can feel this frequency going out from you. You know, if you've worked as an office manager, tell me the difference between not smiling when a lot of people are coming in for a conference and when you just put that smile on and keep it on all day, how much easier it is to do the flow of the people. But if you allow yourself to let go of smiling, people latch onto that and they, they can go into the negative vibration. And the best way for you to hold on to this smile is to play with this idea of putting this yourself in a cocoon in the morning and staying in it till lunch anyway. Then you go to the powder room and then put another one around yourself and go back to work. <laughs> you know, you play with it like kids play with this. And the kids are marvelous. When I work with the kids, they are so fast. And um, somebody said, how, how does that work? I said, because they're still a part, they're not full, you know, especially if they're up to about nine, maybe at 11 or so, it starts to get more full, but up to about 10 years old, you know, uh, they're very vibrant and they want to just vibrate. They still have this close memory of wonderment from being a very young child. And that's an energy source, you see? And you can recall this yourself. You can go back and recall your wonderment, recall your excitement with things, you know? Uh, if you're playing Mendelssohn, well, go and get something harder. <laughs> see what happens. One of the things that happened musician-wise, uh, a lot of musicians talk to me over the years, and they say, did this happen to you? And I'll say, yeah, I don't sing anymore like I used to. But if I pull something out that is a complex classical, uh, you know, thing, uh, what's interesting is if I'm listening to it and I pull the music out, I said, my gosh, now I can hear the whole sections of uh, the way the notes are written. I can hear it, the mechanical design of it. I can hear it like all of a sudden you taught me the code that is behind the website. And all of a sudden I see the website. I don't just see the website. I see the code. That's what was happening. And I don't play a lot of piano, but I read music. When I started with Bonte, I was reading a lot of music still. And, um, you know, I, when I'm listening to stuff, I was hearing all the pieces, especially with Bach you know, hearing all the pieces or uh, some of the other ones that uh, the more modern ones that had a lot of runs and everything in it. I could never hear that before. I had to work on it piece by piece and put it together to work it out, but I wasn't hearing it, methodically hearing it. And all of a sudden I just had that capability. Now, how did that happen? Because we moved stuff that just was reducing out. That's why I think I need to show you the pictures of the brains so you can see what the is going on with the neuro 
cognitive, uh, you know, parts of the brain. So you can see the um, colors that come out from the equipment they have showing you what's crowded in your mind. And someday they're probably going to be able to look in your brain. I, I really think they will be able to look in your brain and see the color that was from the past, the color that's the future and the present time. Maybe that'll happen because they've really gotten to the point where uh, they can actually see the neural pathways of the brain. That's remarkable. Absolutely remarkable. They thought that these things, if they, um, if you had an injury, for instance, nothing came back, that they, if it was a brain cell or part of the neural system, it was dead and gone. And that's old school now. Now we know there is a renewal system. It just didn't need we have to surrender, have fun with it and start working with it to make it work, see? So that's a, it's an interesting thing. So to, yeah, build your sensitivity. Go ahead, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah, so that's a very nice segue to my next question because um, a couple of uh, talks ago, uh, when we were talking about um, craving and clinging, um, yeah. Um, Sister Kema, you made a comment that the brain is like the Brahma Vihara. So I was wondering if you could explain a little bit more by that comment. The brain is like a Brahma Vihara. Well, when you first go into one of the Viharas, you go in at one point and then you develop it and it comes alive. It comes the inherent it's there and then it wakes up and it starts to grow and it starts to expand and the frequency picks up and then you're going from here outward, 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 outward like that. You're growing a frequency for loving kindness. You're growing a frequency for Karuna, for Mudita. And then even the Upeka, you're growing this, this uh, you know, frequency is expanding, you see? In that way, it's the same thing with the brain. But the way the brain is doing it is emptying out. And then as it empties out, the frequency flows out more and it reaches people farther and farther away. And this kind of explains when you when you talk about that way, it is it's like a Brahma Vihara. Your brain is in a really um, cool position when you look, you've heard the comment, you know, we don't have to die to go to heaven or hell. We can create heaven or hell every day right here on earth. The question of do we have to go somewhere to get to heaven or hell is interesting philosophically, historically in philosophy, it's interesting. But the truth is if you look really closely, what you're learning about through dependent origination, everything reducing it down to what's happening, you see, you have control over heaven or hell every day. I think one of the most difficult things is when a person thinks a lot of themselves and they think they're doing really, really well. And then one day um, you might, you know, you've been doing this for a couple of years and you're not angry at all. And then all of a sudden something happens that gets you angry. And it, it if you pause and step back from this situation and you feel really bad that it happened, but it's not just that you're totally shocked that you could even be angry. If you've been through this evolution of this is part of the evolution of growing in this, you know, and when that happens, I think, I don't think the, the anger incident is nearly as bad as the, as you're feeling so incredibly crushed that you were even able to feel angry because you were doing so well and you thought, you couldn't happen. That's the one part that's hard for the person who, who all of a sudden got angry over something because why did it happen? It happened because of a past event that got re-stimulated. It could be one word in a conversation from a bad incident that was back there. And it's like, I thought, you, you know, the person thought, I never want to hear that word again. But it, at first, you don't understand what happened. It just triggered the reaction you had back there in that incident. And so you realize I haven't let go of everything. It's very, um, it's very stable. <laughs> stabilizing to, to you to uh, step back and think, wow, well, okay, fine. Now we just have to work more. You see, that's part one. The other part is the other person who might have thought, um, I can do anything because this person never gets upset. 
and I can do anything or behave any way. And they're never going to say anything about whether they're uncomfortable or not uncomfortable and just do what I want, you know? And then uh, all of a sudden I pushed that person to that point where that happened over here, the other person you see, and that person suffers because uh, they can say they forgive you, but then they don't really forgive you. Now, not forgiving a person. Here's a, here's another one that happens. Person works on forgiveness. And uh, I met one person who was working on forgiveness for a very long time, but they were only forgiving uh, themselves for something. And when the person pops up, they were forgiving them and then they stop. I'm sorry, how did that work? They're forgiving themselves. And then they're starting to forgive the other person but after, when they finally totally let go of it themselves, they think they're finished and they go on to another phrase and they keep going. They don't take the forgiveness program all the way. And then they tell you it doesn't work. I, I do met this for a while and that for a while. They'll say, but it doesn't really work. And the, and the reality is that the meta is not being played out long enough to really discover what it is totally. That's why this description is so good for you to hear all the, sh the shades of what he talks about it is, okay? On the other end um, is that in this situation, um, you know, you, you were out of touch totally with what that really was and you thought it was stabilized and it wasn't. But another way of actually being angry is to say, well, you know, that person got angry at me, so I'm not going to say anything to them. I'm going to freeze them out. And they think that, you know, by doing that, they can be happy in life and just freeze the other person out. Actually, that's a kind of cruelty. And freezing a person out, not speaking to them at all in, in, a, in a living situation or in a work situation, freezing the person out like that, is kind of very cruel. It's a cruel kind of hatred that is not usually identified. And it, it puts the other person in a funny position because they can not approach that person about that. They'll just laugh and say, they're not, they're not. To, it's nothing like uh, anger or the negative stuff. I'm just not going to deal with anything anymore. And they'll say, I forgive, but it's not really let go of. So you thought that the one person who was angry thought they were forgiven, but they weren't. See, it was fake. And the other person's solution was to put themselves in a capsule like this and be in the environment where that person is still working, but not, and, and maybe take the papers and do what you said to do with them, but not talk to you at all in any way, shape or form. And actually that's a, a what do you call it? Aggressive, passive aggressive? Yeah, passive aggressive, because it appears that that person might is not angry, but this is the shade of anger. If we were to go, for instance, I bet if you went into Abhidhamma, they probably have 32 kinds of anger. <laughs> you know, I, I should look that up. You know, <laughs> I, should, I have one of those books here. I could probably fish it out and find it. It's like karma, I said to somebody who was going to start teaching face to face with people. I said, you don't want to change the order of the way Bhante's teaching. Well, well, you don't teach karma, he said. And I said, well, you got to be really careful here because the moment you prick the little, it's like a balloon, you know, karma is like a balloon. But if you prick it and pop the outside, there's another one inside and another one and another one and another one that you got to get rid of all of it, understanding of 11 or 12 or 13 kinds of karma. Yeah, and they're like, why are you making people think that much when you're wanting them to stop thinking and stop doing anything and just sit in meditation? If you, if you give that part to them in your training, you're asking for trouble. And, you know, if you were to talk to a Bhante about it, he would say, oh, yeah, that's something I found out about years ago, <laughs> many years ago. It's why it's not in the program. See it now outside of the program, outside of the 10 day retreat, you want to ask the question and and spend 24 hours talking about karma. You, yeah, OK. <laughs> You want to go have a camp out and let's do it for three nights in a row. And we'll just talk all night about karma until we get to the part where we say, and the basis of all of this is the roundness of things. That's where it went when I was 15 years old. You know, we talked all night long. And the bottom summary of the whole thing was 
the beauty of the roundness of everything, the roundness of the trees, the roundness of the veins in the leaves, the roundness of the stems, the roundness of, of the person, the roundness of your, it was really funny. And that's where everything went. And of course, we finally fell asleep when somebody said, yeah, but what came first? Something had to come from nothing. And then they would argue for, you'd sit there just like wondering, how can they be talking about this? And then they'd all fall asleep. And the next day you, you would get up and start again. <laughs> I think every human being has some kind of memory of doing that, you know. But, but you see what I mean? The dilemma of this thing about anger is, is quite funny because putting yourself in a bubble and, and if you ever accept apology from anybody, if, you, you, if you're not really accepting it, well, I don't know what to say. I mean, you're you're trying to be nice to say I accept your apology or okay, don't worry about it. But if you're if you're doing this kind of behavior, it's not kind. It's not loving kindness, and it's uh, can be very detrimental to your health and their health. You know, the other people that are around you. See. So at some point, people have to come out and figure out what's going on and go back to forgiveness, but really forgive person through the whole entire program, forgiving myself for not understanding, forgiving another person for not understanding, and then keep going with that until the person forgives you and you'll feel relief. And that's how you know it's done or you'll actually see them in your you jump up in your mind just smiling back saying okay fine let it go okay <laughs> and it's done see okay so we went off base there a little bit but it's all about this frequency and that, and the power of that you see when you're working with people i think roey had a question what was your question roey He went out of the room. <laughs> this thing's the problem with Buddhism is there's a hundred thousand pieces of it in a puzzle. And and the um you know when somebody said one time we should get rid of the Anupada Sutta, it's not real. It was probably a Mahayana Sutta or something. So let's just get it out of the the, the um get it out of the um the Majima Nikaya, you know, and I, I was upset about that for like 24 hours. Okay. <laughs> then I went back in there and I looked at it and I read the fact that, that uh, the front of the suit is a bit different than other things. It's true. It, it's sort of uh, different is what the point was. And it was a, a person who studied literature that said this, you know, and, but the problem is that the things that are being talked about when you're praising Sariputta, these things are things that um, when, when you go through the, the different levels of the jhanas, you know, and you're talking about what come, what's there in the first jhana, and then you let go of certain pieces and it's other certain pieces, they come up. So you let go of some and the others arise. Eat from the first to the second, the second to the third, the third to the fourth, okay? So when you're talking about Sariputta and you're praising him, when you think about it, if a person is concentrating and doing one point of concentration and they're causing attention up here in their mind, then these things that they talk about within each one of these jhanas, they could never experience those, no matter how hard they tried, because they've been putting habitual uh, habit on concentrating really hard on something, see, as an object. So they would never be able to experience um, the rapture, the pleasure, the unification of mind, the contact, feeling, perception, thoughts, and and uh, and mind. Okay, and the enthusiasm, decision. They they couldn't make decisions if they're doing one point of concentration in the process of doing it. You're concentrating to become absorbed, and if you're absorbed, you can't you can't make a decision and control your energy and and the mindfulness if their mindfulness definition is different than ours you see we're saying it's an observation skill you see and you develop it and the uh, the equanimity their equanimity means i'm totally locked in this place 
and absorbed. When you talk about the globe, we talk about using it. When you're walking, and 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 to, we talk about it that way. When you're walking with loving kindness, sending to all sentient beings or all beings, however you want to say it, so that when the frequency goes out, it bounces back and it doubles and triples, and you you can wake up your sensitivity that way by just staying in the globe. Another way of doing it after you do that a little bit is go get a chair and go sit up on a hill that's filled with flowers and just sit there and meditate with the sky above you and open to everything. And then see what happens after you've been practicing inside this this globe structure like this, then see what happens if you let it go. And of course, my favorite one is choose somebody, you know, from wherever you are in Australia, who's in Texas, who's your friend that you want to send it to and and then call her four days later and see what happened for the weekend (laughs) and see if it reached her after that. See what happened. Having the experience with people of finding out that the person they were sending it to, um, it's a wonderful thing to listen to people talk about that, you know, how it works. And I think I told you all about the woman in Bali in the retreat, sending it to the old roommate from college who lived in Austin, Texas. Now, they were not communicating for 12 and a half years at all, not writing notes, nothing, no phone, nothing after college. And when she started using her old roommate for this project, doing loving kindness, the woman went to the sorority or something to one of the people that were in, they were in the sorority at college and said, where is she? And she's in Bali and she owns a retreat center and calls the office and asks for her. And she's, I can't stop thinking about you. I've been thinking about you all weekend. I don't even know why, what are you doing? Why, where are you there? Where are you? and started talking, she was so excited. I was excited. (laughs) I'm excited because there it was. Bali, you know, right near Bora Vidor in in Bali. Okay, all the way to Austin, Texas. There you go. And so this can happen. And people will call you and just say, hi, I've thought of you for a week, a long time. And all of a sudden here, I have this feeling I have to, I have to reach out to you. And that's what happened to them in Texas. So what is this? How does a radio wave move across the earth? How do they work? Look up that on the internet and see the little pictures. You know how it goes up and bounces off the cloud. Like this hits a mountain, goes up again. Da, da, da. <laughs> it goes up to the space station and then bounces down again. I don't know. But these are waves of energy and frequencies move through the firmament up and down from the stratosphere again to another place. So we are communicating. What can we say? You see? not speaking, communicating. And we're this far away is what they say from telepathy. But as women, maybe we're that far. I'm not sure. (laughs) Okay. So um, there's something you should look up on the internet. It'll give you a really good laugh. All of you should look this up on the internet. And you put in um, the um, comedian tells a story about the difference between a woman's brain and a man's brain. You put that in and you put little quotes around it and the story will come up. It's a it's a comedic comedy act, uh, but it's he's telling you the truth. (laughs) He really is. And this this guy will be standing there and he'll, he'll do try to find the one that's about seven minutes long. Some of them cheated. They made one that was like three minutes or four minutes, but it's not quite as good. But there's one about seven minutes long and telling you what happens when you pull the skull off here and you look inside a woman's brain, put the lid back on, walk to the other side of the stage, open up the skull on the male skull, look inside and describe what's there. And what is the difference? (laughs) It's really wonderful. I think it's a wonderful thing. And it's not being critical. It's just talking. I mean, this idea that, you know, gender equality is the most important thing on the face of the earth to just even consider the fact 
I'm thinking of my Chinese friends with 7,000 years of genealogy under their belt, and you want to get rid of yin and yang. <laughs> there, come on. There is a difference between the way that we process what we do in our brain and a man does. There just is. I'm sorry, it is not a big deal. I could tell you all the ladies to go out and work with truck drivers for a week or lumberjacks, and you, you'd find out. <laughs> You know, um, but women have to go to lunch and have a coffee clutch and talk about it with their neighbors and then come back the next day and have another coffee clutch and then decide what to do. But men is like, you know, OK, OK, all right, let's do it. And then it's done. Let's come back and watch a football game. That's all. <laughs> it's really easy. <laughs> you know what it is. It's a very big difference, though. So I don't think we should criticize this. I think we should learn how to work with it together. And um, I thought that women's liberation movement, it was okay. First of all, I really did like pants suits. I mean, I have to tell you at that time, I thought that was a great idea. But the idea that you had to succeed as a corporate leader if you're a woman by wearing a men's suit is not my idea of fun. You know? <laughs> I mean, you know, I think it would be it, on your own terms, you can actually do quite well in the business world. And just do it. Don't talk about it. Just go there and do it. It's like I said to um, a few weeks back, I said, you're such an active nun. I said, no, I'm just, just doing stuff. I'm just doing it. I don't want to sit and talk about it. Um, I don't have to discuss uh, equality about anything. Just talk about the Dhamma. And the other person talks about the Dhamma. And we might get a new insight to that part of the Dhamma. That's all. That's all I'm asking for. Don't mention anything else. And if you do the work and you help the people and remember reciprocity in the monastic structure is very important. The reciprocity of the Buddhist agreement between the monastics and the lay people. We do something for them to help them reduce their suffering and show them ways of being happier in life. They give us food and shelter and medicine and clothes. Buddhist shelter medicine. That's right. Four of them. Four, four, four little pieces. And you can do a lot with that. And you can have a lovely life and be happy and help other people be happy. You see? So that's that one. Rowie, did you come back? <laughs> you there? I don't know. I think I'm not sure. Hi there. Did you did you have a question? You I know you had a question. What was it? <clears throat> yeah. Do you have a question? Uh, yeah, the question. Oh, my father. I'm sorry, I didn't hear it. What is it? No, oh, I didn't say anything. Oh, okay. <laughs> so what do you, are you using Meta with what you're doing with your parents? Does it help you with your parents? Mm -hmm. Does it? Yeah, it's, it's a difficult thing. You know, it's hard work. Uh, when we're caring for our elders, it takes a lot. And um, the, the key, the patience and using compassion and remembering, sometimes it's upsetting because you can't take away the other person's um, pain or suffering. You cannot change it. And it, I think it's very frustrating that we go through these periods of time when we're really trying to help someone. And I think that's where nurses you know, they get this in school, they learn it, you know, that when they're in the hospital and they're working with somebody uh, to comfort the person, and this is the compassion part of comforting the person, that the, that's where the importance of the definition of compassion really comes in. Okay, so the nurse who doesn't remember this, that's the one that's going to get really exhausted. She might want to do extra shifts, but she might not have it in her 
And the reason she might not have enough energy to do it is because of the way she's doing it. So looking at compassion more closely becomes really important. So with compassion, if I see a person first, I see a person in pain. And the second thing right away in your brain should be, I understand that their pain is their pain, okay? It's not my pain. The third one is I can, what can I do for them? So the active compassion comes now. And the active compassion is not for you to take away their pain. That's where we get lost. The active compassion is, can I provide them, help to provide them a place where they have the space they need to go through what they have to go through with their pain? And can I love and support them unconditionally? These four pieces are active compassion. This is what we almost need to make a stitchery of it, put it up on the wall where we can keep reminding ourselves, you know, because we can't do that. You know, we, when I was working with children in Texas in a hospital that were terminally ill children, and all you wanted to do was take them in your arms and say, I can take this pain away. You cannot take the person's pain away who has bone cancer or sarcoma or lymphomas and things like that, where they're totally exhausted. You cannot get them anything you can do. There's nothing you can do, but you can bring the canoeing trip down the rapids to them and prop them up in bed and let the nine-year-old take a look at what it would be like to get in a canoe and shoot the rapids in, or in Oregon. And that's his dream. And you want to see that before I leave. And the Cancer patients are interesting because a lot of them, they come to be the rock in the family before they die. Meaning, especially the children, because the children can get through, they, they have a way of getting through the whole experience better than the parents can. And they become the rock for the parent. The very first one I ever worked with was Marie and her father, Tom, in Belgium. And the situation was that mom and dad are divorced. So dad has taken care of the 13-year-old and she has a had a tumor in the back of her head, the size of a, uh, unfortunately, the size of a tennis ball almost. And it's inoperable. And the end is going to come. You're going to go to sleep one night and not wake up. Okay. But She's there and she's losing weight because the whole body is going to try to fight this tumor and she's turning into being a very tiny little thing. And this was her junior prom year. Junior prom year was when this was happening for her and she couldn't go to prom. But she saw her father suffering through this and I was teaching him and he was teaching her to do loving kindness for each other in the living situation. And she decided that her dad was going to be her uh, knight in shining armor or the white, the white hat, the white hat cowboy. And she went, had sent a friend to buy her father a 10 gallon white hat. <laughs> he sent a picture at the time and uh, said, I am the, the one that comes home and cheers her up. But she was cheering him up. And the night of the prom, he brought, he brought a present to her and she opened it up. It was a prom dress. And he dressed her in, she, at this point, at this point, she's near the end and her friends are all coming to her to say goodbye. And she's telling them how much she thanks them for being her friend in her life. And she loves them so much. And she's giving away her stuff to each one of them, something to keep which was really great, Tom told me later. And um, it's so compassion pouring out of this little girl, you know? And he shows up with this dress and he helps her to get dressed in this dress and picks her up in his arms and goes in the other room and turns the songs she wants to listen. They had all figured out the songs. They had built a scrapbook together. We had them build a scrapbook together uh, for him when she's gone. And she worked on it with him and everything, which was absolutely fantastic. You know, doing this when the people are conscious, not waiting till they go in a coma and doing it after they die, but doing it while the person is conscious 
and having them contribute to the stories you want them to remember and the pictures and the adventures and everything into the scrapbook. Wonderful project if the people are awake, you know, to, to go over the good things they did in their life. And he has her in his arms and he's dancing with her. You know, he said it was fantastic. Neither one of them were crying. And he even let her have some champagne before she went to bed, had her some sips, some champagne. And um, it was only two days later and she passed away in her sleep. But that memory, you know, of him in the big white hat <laughs> dancing with her. I said, did you have the hat on? Oh, yeah, I had the hat on. And he was dressed up, you know. So these are the kind of things people do for each other. This is the beautiful side of humanity. This is what compassion is really, really supposed to be. It's not supposed to be a quiet thing of, of just sympathy. The problem with compassion is today we have words, you know, going around. We have precepts with gossip and slander. Nobody knows what gossip means. Nobody knows what slander is. They say it, but they don't know what it is. We have to make sure you understand what gossip is and what slander is when you say you won't do it, okay? Well, another example of this is compassion because you've got sympathy, you have empathy, and you have compassion. If you're talking about sympathy, well, Hallmark shops that make cards worldwide, Hallmark, you know, they separate the cards. Um, congratulations on your marriage. Congratulations on the birth. Congratulations on the birthdays are, are all in one section. And then you have somebody dies, sympathy cards. You see sympathy card. After the person dies, you send them a sympathy card. The person's not dead. Hello. <laughs> you don't be doing the sympathy thing yet. Okay. When they're still alive was my point. All right. The next one is empathy and empathy is a problem. Empathy is a problem because it's a nice word. You're very empathetic. I had an empathetic visit with Aunt Sue. Well, Aunt Sue was dying of cancer in the hospital. So what's an empathetic visit to Aunt Sue? And the person describes it. I got there and I, I saw her and she was so sad. Oh, so sad. I got sad. And then I moved the chair from the right to the left. And I moved the curtain from the left to the right. And I folded her her. Oh, she was so sad, so sad. And she was feeling Aunt Sue's sadness. So what'd she do for Aunt Sue that day? We don't want to talk about that. <laughs> she took Aunt Sue from here, maybe down to there, you see. But it, instead of lifting the person up, okay? So empathy is not a really great thing when a person is dying. It's, uh, it's part of uh, what May was talking about, intuition. Empathy is kind of part of that. I have a thing operating now. It's very strange. I, I know it's getting pretty accurate when the person's arriving at the front door. I'm in here in the back and the door is locked here and I'm, I'm in this cave where I work. But I know when the person's arriving before they even park the car and come in. I don't know how. But it works pretty well. So it's like an intuitive thing is turned on. It's kind of empathetic, feeling the waves of the person arriving. And if a person comes that's very down, I know they're down. I go in there up more to try to uplift them. That's what we're supposed to be doing in life. So in a, in a way, I'm saying even though it's a heavy-duty job to play with them and to uplift them and decide I'm going in with a smile and I'm going to be in this I'm going to be in this meta bubble today and I'm going to feel this goodness and open my bubble when I'm helping you and I'm working with you but the compassion a living compassion works based on these three points of knowledge okay that person has pain and it's theirs nothing you can do about that you can't take it away from them okay I know it's theirs, okay? And then the third one is, what can I do? I know they need space. They need to stay warm or cool and they need water and they need food. And I can do this for them. And also I need to listen, you know? You're in an ideal position for something. I don't know if you've done it or not because I know both your parents are there, but you should let them tell their story to you. You should spend like one month a year where I don't know if they're in the same room or if they're in two rooms, but you should get them to tell you how they grew up, 
Because there's one thing that people don't do, and even if it's a close, close family, in a lot of parts of the world, we never find out why in the world or how in the world did my mother get to be the way she is with people and with me and with the family? How did that happen? So you, this woman in the Midwest in the United States one time, she said the problem with women and their mothers or women and the fathers, but sons with their father, maybe two, we don't spend any time saying, tell me what it was like when you were eight years old. Tell me what you were doing. Let them tell you their stories. And you know what will happen? Even if it's a bad situation with a parent and child, it will change. Because once you understand the hardship and you're listening to the suffering, and it doesn't matter if they were poor or medium or well off or rich, it doesn't matter. A lot of the behavior stuff that came out as adults happened because of what happened as children. And the frustrations and not being able to do what they really wanted to do and had the opportunity in the case of my mother, she's deceased, may she rest in peace. At 15, she was invited by the Swiss Olympic coach to become part of the Swiss team. They, they took people from different countries, Switzerland a lot of times, and she to swim. And her father was thrilled and her mother said no. And her grandmother got into it and said, absolutely not. You are a lady and you will not be doing that and took it away. From that point at 15, where that was denied, that was a downhill thing, <laughs> you know? And from there you can listen and you, and you start hearing pieces you never know about, but no matter what you hear, you have to play a game. And it's called yes therapy. <laughs> so no matter what they say, you don't take anything personally, even if they're talking about you from the perspective of, you know, my problems happened, Rowie, when you were born. If you hear that one, you say, oh, how was the birth? How did it go? You find out what happened. But it's, it's like, it's a yes therapy, it doesn't matter. I, I have one person called me and they said, I said, what's the hardest part about being back and not being able to travel anymore? Basically, you know, I don't want to visit uh, my mother. <laughs> my mother thinks this, my mother thinks that they should, you know, I should, and they say I need and I must. And, <laughs> and I said, the interesting part about this, I think was that this was a large family. The mother had had many children, seven or eight. And this was the youngest one. Okay. And um, so that means the mother's in her 70s, you see, so that the, the idea that what I suggested, and I don't know what they did, I don't know, I suggested just go visit your mom and do yes therapy with her, no matter what she says, go find the kind of flowers the person really loves and arrive with the flowers, give her a big hug. And he said, but I don't agree with anything. So I don't, you don't need to tell her that. First of all, what's your mother going to do? Your mother's going to give you advice. Why? Because they're your mother. But why? You know, because they want you to be happy. Underneath all of it, the mother wants you to be happy. So what's the hurt in the whole thing? Because you know perfectly well that when you leave the house, you're not going to do what she said. <laughs> you already have an idea what you're going to do. You're not going to do it. So why not just accept the advice from an elder and say with your experience, just you don't have to butter it up too much, but if somebody's almost 80, they obviously have some life experience, you know, <laughs> and can you respect the life experience of the elder and you don't necessarily have to follow through with the advice you hear, but the question is, can you listen to the advice the person gives you uh, and sincerely listen to it and let them know you're listening to it and you will consider it. That's not saying you agree with it, is it? It's not saying you're going to go do it, right? But you value it. That's what they're after also. At this age, they're after being valued, you know, for what they know. So you go on and you accept the advice. But accepting the advice, it's advice. It's not an order. It's like the precepts are not 
commandments, their advice, because the Buddha lived the commandments and tested, I'm sorry, the precepts, and he tested them and he said, look, here's what happened to me. There's lots of suttas that are sitting there. You know, here's what happened to me here. Here's what happened to me there. Here's what happened. You know, so my advice is follow these because they're going to keep you on this side and you won't have any bumps in the road when you try to meditate to go through. But if you go on that side, you're going to have all kinds of residual problems and you're not, they're going to cause you not to be able to meditate. You see, so this is the same game. It's the same game all over again. So in working with people who are disabled, working with people who are uh, faced with heavy mobility issues or people even who are in depression, you know, the big thing is listening and just saying yes but not, you don't surrender your sanity. You don't surrender your life work. You don't have to follow what they're saying, but you do in a way you should, let's say, you should be able to accept the advice based on the years of experience they've had in the world through all the stuff they've been through. And you think, well, what have they been through? <laughs> I've been through what I've been through. You know, well, get a history book take a look <laughs> you know if somebody's in their 70s and 80s it chances are they 80s they could have been in coming just right after world war ii and gone through an awful lot of stuff you know to get to this point here and different wars and things and all kinds of stuff with politics that happened worldwide and we don't know how to even look at that let them talk you see and give them the space and get her the flowers, you know, get your dad, whatever, but, <laughs> but, you know, get your mom some flowers, find out what she really liked that she used to get from her dad, your dad, and, and then just surprise her with some simple things. So it's this like, how can I make this so it's more fun? And I know it's not fun. Oh boy, do I know it's not fun, <laughs> you know, but, but honestly, how, can I make it more light for everybody involved? And I know it's difficult and I really have a great deal of respect for the work you're doing. So bless you and everything. So that's the spiel on this, compassion, real compassion as it's written. And then we look at it and remember it every day. That's where I need to be. I don't need to be in these other places and allow joy to come up, stay with joy. When they're in pain, I don't know how much they practice or what they ever did. Teach them to love their body and forgive their body and appreciate their body for carrying them through life as far as they have come. You see, and see the part of the body is perfect that is hurting. I do this a lot with my knee. I don't know if it's listening, <laughs> you know, but I, this one of my knees is getting worse, but, um, but I can sleep better if I just go to sleep saying, you know, this, this thing. And I also, you know, I can try to give you um, this loving kindness, family loving kindness thing that was so neat that came from a man in Oregon that is a family practice of loving kindness that he and his two sons did the whole time they were growing up every single night. They would rather do this with their dad, lay on the bed and go through this prayer with loving kindness than to listen to a story or wrestle with him before bed or anything else they said. And they're married now. They have kids and they're doing it, you see. So the trick to all of this is repetition if you wanna have change happen. That's the trick. And so we just keep going and we keep sharing and that's it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. That's good. So are we done? Everybody happy? Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to do a blessing now. Let's do our blessing. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth 
devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Uh, we have to we have to do this part. If we don't, the bell will probably jump up and hit me.